very nice to see so many people in the seats, uh, and um, very welcome to you. Um, we're going to talk about the internet and the current state of the internet. Uh, when I got on the internet, it was sometime in the 90s. In the 90s, going on the internet uh, was uh, a very nice and entertaining thing. You could go on the internet. It, we were always waiting for new things to happen. It was a big democratic tool. It was something we were expecting something about. Currently, when I enter the internet, I'm a bit in doubt on what is actually happening there, and I don't really know what I'm going on for. Uh, so I would like to start uh, with asking uh, the first question here today. Uh, Anne, how do you feel uh, when you go on the internet in the morning? How do you feel about it? What do you expect from it? Well, um, when we were talking about the internet back in the 90s and in the 10s, we were focusing on all of the progressive aspects of the internet, the way it would bring us closer to our politicians. Uh, the way it would bring us closer to each other and uh, connect us in political movements. Uh, but what has happened during the last couple of decades is that we probably forgot to be aware of the infrastructure below all of these possibilities and the immense importance of ownership when it comes to uh, the infrastructure of the Internet. Uh, for that reason, and for that reason, I'm perhaps a bit less optimist about the internet today. Peter Sonder, I know uh, when you connect to the internet, you're saying you're not really connecting to the internet. Well, I'm, I'm one of the people who actually go on the internet, and then other people go to the dark nets I call Facebook and Twitter and so on, <laughs> uh, which is just on top of the internet. Uh, very few people actually use just the internet. Uh, most people use other services. Uh, the benefit internet. So I feel I feel lonely on the internet. It's just me and a few other people. <laughs> but you are not the that only many. person left on the internet. No, actually. we're very few, and we're very strange people that decided not to be on uh, like all of these other platforms uh, that have dominated the internet. But you say that Facebook is not the internet. Not anymore. I would say it's it's its own network and it's its own state. Even uh, it's actually the biggest state in the, in the nation uh, in the world. Uh, so, so I. I just don't feel that it's uh, what the internet was supposed to be and, and what, not, what the technology was built for something completely different. And just as Anna Matt is saying, it was a different ideal and a different sort of mindset that built the internet and then someone kind of took the, the innocence away from the internet and made something really awful. One of the things that really took uh, the innocence away from the internet is the slide we have uh, behind us here. It's uh, a prism slide. It's uh, from uh, the Snowden leaks, and it's actually we are on a historical week this week. It's, uh, this was released at the 7th of June 2013. Uh, I think it was this, well, this week, uh, five years ago, sometimes, that uh, Mr. Snowden sat in uh, his hotel room in Hong Kong, uh, giving away uh, secrets and uh, offloading all this stuff. But the thing about this uh, slide up here is one of the first things that was published uh, at the Snowden leaks. And I find it, uh, personally, have found it very disturbing, uh, mostly because it confirmed uh, things that uh, the tech community had been talking about for a long time. I know you, uh, you were not surprised when this came out. No, as a technologist, uh, you know, working with, as an internet provider and so on, we already knew that the governments were asking for wiretaps and have direct connections to all of the cables. And like, you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to just add one and one together. It, it's not, it was obvious. And, and before uh, PRISM, we were talking about something called Echelon as well, which was another like a mythical thing. Because we knew that the governments were taking all of the data somewhere, and there was just no discussion. And when you, when you said something about this, uh, people looked at you as a conspiracy theorist, even though it's like, no, really, there is data coming here. There's a government connection. Like, no. Uh, so technologists, in like the mass um, of the technologists, they knew kind of that there was a program like this. Maybe not the extent of it and how well developed it was and how much cooperation between governments, but it was not a surprise. And when you, uh, when you uh, uh, heard of uh, the Snowden leaks and uh, saw that uh, all the internet that we are kind of using, all the services that we are using are being penetrated by, uh, by intelligence services, how did you feel about that at the time? Well, it's obviously against the law. <laughs> So someone should act on it, and uh, the problem right now is that uh, as individuals, we cannot really act on it. So we 
feel a bit, you know, ashamed that we keep using the internet even though we know about all this, but I really don't think we should because it's not something that we can change. It's something that we really have to make our politicians responsible for. So I think it's the very necessary first step to do anything about this. It's been five years since uh, that time. The Danish politician's answer has been uh, there's no reason to believe that uh, illegal surveillance is going on in Denmark. Uh, is that the response uh, we were hoping for at the time? No, not at all. And I'm uh, a bit surprised that our politicians uh, apparently do not take this problem more seriously than they do, because it's a serious democratic problem. Yeah. Sunde, what did you... Uh, you saw the Swedish politicians too. How did they react to this? Well, they were really upset when they saw this slide and, and all, the, all the other information coming from Snowden, because they realized they were not one of the top eight uh, governments cooperating with the US. So the Swedish government actually, or the, the surveillance part of the government, they went and asked for more money so they could actually become one of the most successful partners of the NSA. Because they, that was the information they got out of this, that they're not giving enough data to the United States. Uh, and they actually managed to get more funds. So they're the most funded by uh, institution in Sweden per employee is the surveillance uh, part of the Swedish government. And we didn't really talk about that uh, <laughs> in, in society. Um, and the discussion in the public was the opposite, like, why are you surveilling so much? So we have this uh, kind of disconnect between what the politicians are doing and what the public think they're doing and, and want them to do. And, and then we have this total lack of caring from the general audience. There's a feeling of uh, giving up, I think, that we can't really change anything, which makes also like, the, the, the people that really want to have surveillance uh, really successful. Yeah, one of, one of the problems was with, with the, uh, when uh, these revelations came out, uh, as you talked about uh, earlier, then uh, a lot of us said, okay, we, we were right, we were not tinfoil heads. Yeah. And uh, I was actually personally greeted by many people saying, oh, you were right about that. Yeah. And, and then we all sat down and expected something to happen, yeah. uh, and, and then things should change, but it happened. No, nothing, nothing has changed at all. We are, we are still continuing and, uh, and uh, we are still inside this. So we are at the double situation of both knowing that surveillance is going on, but not being able to do something about it. I know you have an expression about that. Yeah, I, I, it's like the Matrix, but you took both pills. Um, so you're like you <laughs> kind of figured out what was happening and you decided, I'm going to stay in this Matrix, mm -hmm. because it's really nice knowing it's a Matrix. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, that's just really, really, uh, it's a fucked up situation. I don't understand how people in general just let that happen. Mm. How we cope with it. Uh, yeah. see, let's take the next slide here. Uh, and I know, I know you, you believe in that uh, we should uh, be able to regulate this. We, our politicians should, uh, should do something yes. about it. And, yes. you, uh, and you are t taking an allergy into uh, the car manufacturing business. Yes, exactly. So if you're wondering why we have this logo from Volkswagen here, it's because I'm pointing to the recent scandal about Volkswagen hiding their emission, the scale of their emissions. Because in that situation, you would not ex uh, expect the individual car driver to take the responsibility, would you? Would you expect that the individual car driver would be able to actually look into the, his car to figure out whether it was legal or not? Uh, you would expect that a public authority would define a clear level, uh, uh, level of emission and also make sure that this re uh, regulation was actually uh, held uh, by individual actors uh, in society. So in that case, there is no doubt that we, we know that we can not do this job without societal regulation. But when we talk about the internet, we tend to believe that we can solve this problem by teaching more digital literacy in schools so that we can make our young people as individuals more aware of it. And I really think we should, but I don't think we should expect that this would solve problems of this size. Yeah, but, but you are actually, what you're talking against is that we are playing it over to the individual. Yeah. Uh, it shouldn't be uh, the single person sitting at home and saying, how do I fight the NSA or everything else or Facebook yeah. or stuff like that. It should be a governmental uh, yeah. thing to do. But where do you see them uh, working currently? Uh, well, basically, for instance, we need a general rule, for example, about data collection. I think it's crazy to believe that we can turn everything about data into a matter of consent 
between a consumer and a commercial service provider on the, on the internet. We should have basic rights that you cannot sell like your firstborn for access to Facebook, for instance. For instance, it would be obvious to say all data will have to be deleted within one or two or whatever, five years. If we do something criminal in Denmark, it will be deleted from our papers within five years. Why isn't it the same way with data, for instance? No matter what you choose to sign in an end-user license agreement. One of the things that uh, is supposed to do something for us, one of the things the politicians actually uh, cooked up, uh, yeah. is the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, yeah. uh, which is supposed to do that. How do you, do, don't you think this will uh, affect some of this? No, because, uh, well, yes and no. Of course, it does change something. Uh, the GDPR does include some new important words, such as profiling, so that it's not only data collection. It is also the way that you are being profiled that makes an important difference. But on the other hand, it turns this whole question into a, you know, a transaction between a consumer and a service provider. It doesn't treat us as citizens with basic human rights, and I think data should be a basic human right. How do you feel about uh, GDPR? It has been, uh, it's been made and created by people who uh, in the beginning had an, a, a kind of an activistic way of looking into it and saying we could, uh, we could really, we could maybe tame Facebook or the big social media companies and we could, could, could control of where our data goes. Now it's in, in action. Do, uh, do, uh, is this going to work? No, I think it's going to change minimal things. It's way too late. And the best thing about GDPR are all of the funny jokes that came out with it. <laughs> it's like people are joking quite a lot about like solving all of the issues. Uh, and, and I think it's really, really way, way, way to, uh, past actually doing anything. I think uh, we should have had, had harsher um, legislation for, as, as Anna Med is saying, like rights for the consumers and citizens. Uh, and in, in Finland, we actually made the internet a human right uh, a few years back. And that was really interesting because we, made, we had to have a discussion about what the internet is and had to define the internet and, and these things. So a lot of the, these laws that are now being passed in the European Union and other countries, they cannot be passed in Finland because they would violate human rights. And it's a good example of if you're proactive instead of being reactive, which I would say GDPR is mm. basically reactive. Uh, it's trying to limit things. It's, uh, it's very much like a condom. Instead of fixing the disease, we're just like protecting ourselves a little bit. But the problem is with a condom, you don't want to eradicate the disease in this case. Uh, we should do that, just not focus on the defense. I know you're thinking about most of what uh, people are trying to do as, as damage control. Uh, yeah. The internet is already broken. Yeah, yeah, it's broken and it's on the level that we can't really fix it. So we can do damage control and then we can be a little bit more proactive in the next fight uh, and not focus too much on... It's very much like uh, Monty Python, like the, the knights who say knee. The, you lose an arm, you lose a leg, and in the end you use the head trying to say no. That's where we are. That's GDPR. It's the head saying no, no body. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But, and and it's, it's a sad realization, but then also if we can agree with that, maybe we can focus on the next fight and win that, because someone else is trying to fight that already or trying to just like not talk about these things happening. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, but that's, that's a very sad situation we, if we are just the head of the knight who says knee yeah. uh, standing in the, at the roadside. I, maybe we're just the ear of the head, even. <laughs> maybe just yeah, the ear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think it's that bad, uh, Edmita? Well, that, yes and no. I think, you know, the, <clears throat> the opposition between a so civil society on one hand insisting on basic, you know, democratic values that are trying to somehow tie up enormous capitalist powers on the other hand. That's not really new. It's an ongoing fight. It has been going on for decades, and I think it's important that we understand it that way. That fight can never be entirely won. It never was, but that's not an excuse for not fighting. I think we should uh, take a video with uh, some people who are, uh, are very enthusiastic about what they're doing mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in their own way fighting for something, uh, maybe not uh, the same thing as GDPR, but they are fighting for something. Problem. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear 
is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you? Let's listen. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like. What service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. That was a real call you just heard. The amazing thing is the assistant can actually understand the nuances of conversation. We've been working on this technology for many years. It's called Google Duplex. It brings together all our investments over the years in natural language understanding, deep learning, text-to-speech. By the way, when we are done, the assistant can give you a confirmation notification saying your appointment has been taken care of. Let me give you another example. Let's say you want to call a restaurant, but maybe it's a small restaurant which is not easily available to book online. The call just stop it and move on to the next slide. Uh, not because of that. We will just we need to discuss this, but we need to stop the video. Uh, what you were seeing there was uh, the video of uh, that was a robot uh, that was making an appointment for a haircut. Uh, the Google uh, designers were obviously very happy about it. The, the crowd there were tech people uh, who were cheering on uh, this uh, enormous feast. They have been uh, making this. Uh, this robot who can both talk and understand, and which is deeply buried within the user's uh, calendar and phone book. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also caused a backlash because people said, hey, then I don't know what I'm talking to. It might be a robot all over in the future. Uh, where does this thing like uh, this uh, Google AI, start, Google Duplex, as it's called, where does this take us, Peter? Well, I have multiple views on this. First of all, I think it's interesting that the guy said that they've been working on it for many years, because I think it was many years since you actually called someone to book appointments. <laughs> uh, thanks to mostly Google as well to actually make it like we skip this. Uh, I think. In all honesty, it will be robots calling other robots to set up appointments. Uh, so maybe I'm fine with that. But the problem is that you're making yourself a slave to the robot, I would say. Like the robot is now you, uh, your voice. And it's also, as you say, it's in your phone book and your calendar. And you have to like abide to what the robot agrees with other robots when you are supposed to be places and so on. So it, it is uh, dystopian in many ways. But then again, I'm not really scared because I think uh, the technology is already outdated in many ways because no one uses a phone to call anymore. I just like, that's the app people want to delete. It's like the phone app from their I, phone. I keep thinking about uh, the ideal situation would be a whole bunch of Google robots calling each other and mm. making uh, strange arrangements of their own. So I can tell, uh, 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 like 10 years ago, I, I worked in a, a company that uh, managed phone lines. We had phone services. And then one of the things I did is when people called in from known sales numbers, I put them in their own queue. And I just let them wait with music. And if another salesperson called in at the same time, they could talk to each other. So I had like a party line of salespeople. They could never reach me, just like each other. So hope that will be the future for Google as well. We could maybe uh, combine that with Google Duplex. That would be very interesting. Yeah, uh, the, the problem is, can I record the phone calls or not? Because you, you need consent of at least one person, I think. Mm. But it, it would be fun to listen to. But it's also an example of what Google is doing is they are also the players within uh, what we can call uh, surveillance capitalism. Uh, the reason they're making this uh, duplex thing is to uh, be able to uh, monitor our uh, phone book uh, and uh, to be inside our calendars and learn more about us and about profiling. Uh, but what, uh, what about profiling? You, you know, uh, you, you've been talking about that people kind of invent uh, strategies to, uh, to not get profiled. Uh, what can you do if you don't mm, want to do that? No, 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 it's not really people.
people inventing profiles uh, or uh, strategies not to be profiled, but in my uh, research on digital media and everyday life, it's obvious that you see all these small acts of resistance all the time. So we keep talking about all these algorithms coming after us or changing our lives, and we tend to talk about ourselves as totally helpless in this game. And even though, of course, there are decisions that will have to be made at a higher political level, I think it's also important to look at those small acts of resistance that people might make, actually, to turn off their phones at strategic points during the day, to uh, keep different types of communication about, apart, to use different browsers, and in different ways, you know, to turn off all notifications on the phone so it won't invade your everyday life. Yeah, there are several acts of resistance that people use in order to keep this technology out of their everyday lives. So it's not just, you know, technology acting on us, it's also us acting on technology, and we shouldn't forget that. Yeah, do you think, but um, what can you do? To, is it possible to stop being profiled? No, I think the, the method to do is like most of the people that I work with that are activists or, or deal with the sensitive information, uh, I've been working with everything from like Syrian activists to WikiLeaks and so on. Uh, you have multiple profiles. That's the best way to kind of mm. avoid the situations. Like you have a public profile that give the minimum amount of data to not lo uh, look uh, suspicious. So if you have no data, people will look at you like, what's wrong with this person? Or the, the government can do it, or the Facebook can see that someone is being tagged on pictures, but it doesn't have a profile. You, you're singled out by not being on the social media. You're much more visible, actually. So you have to give up minimum amount of, of uh, data, and then you have different profiles that you use for different services. And, mm -hmm. and then there's lots of tools you can use, so of course, that sometimes really important, but uh, I think, again, like we, we should be maybe more offensive towards our politicians rather than have to be defensive on our own usage. Mm. But today, we have to do maybe both. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we look at the, the, the slide behind us, uh, that shows uh, one of our politicians. Yeah, uh, you could, could you describe what it is? So, uh, like a, a little bit over a week ago, Mark Zuckerberg was in, in the European Parliament uh, being asked questions about Cambridge Analytica and the Trump uh, voting and so on. And this is a picture by one of the people that was questioning him about everything. She wanted a, a, a fan picture for, for herself and posted this on Twitter, like, see, oh, I met Mark Zuckerberg. She didn't even spell the name right, but that's a different thing. Uh, but she's so, so excited about meeting him just after, uh, after questioning him. And uh, I've been to prison before, and I remember uh, when a prison guard came up to me and asked for my autograph. And this reminds me very much of the same situation. <laughs> um, uh, and it's really, really sad. Like, it's, yeah. uh, this is a person that should punish him, not want to be on a picture with him. So mm. what does this happen? What, what happens to a guy like Mark Zuckerberg? He's like uh, a new kind of, uh, he's, he's a startup rock star in many ways. Yeah, so we, since, you know, basically since Michael Jackson died, we haven't had superstars anymore, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't get new ones. Um, <laughs> And I think the, the people we're lo looking up to now are the tech uh, people. So we're looking up to startup founders. I like the new rock stars very much. So I go to a lot of tech conferences, and, and I see like if some of the people that are famous from Skype or whatever, if they're anywhere nearby, there will always be people just like coming up to them, wanting pictures and selfies, and like they are basically the new rock stars. But the difference is like uh, music can influence your life in a positive way and, and negative as well. But uh, these tech companies can control your life in a much different way. They control society as well. So by having this celebrity status uh, given to them, I think we are not uh, demanding them to take responsibility in the same way uh, as we would with politicians or other people with influence. We're not looking at them as business people. We're looking at them as you know, creative, funny founders that give great uh, things to their employees and, and do things differently and you know, have t-shirts on instead of a suit. Um, <laughs> In. Yes, I just wanted to follow up. I think one reason for that is that people basically don't understand surveillance capitalism. So, uh, politically, we try to deal with state surveillance as a problem. And generally, when we think about surveillance, we think about our mom looking after us all the time. But cap surveillance capitalism is something different. Uh, and uh, it's about uh, data being made on you that can be analyzed and sold to other actors. And I think one reason why people don't take it more seriously than that is that they think it's all about advertisement. You know, they only think they can think of as 
commercial uses is advertisement, but commercial uses go so much above and beyond uh, advertisement today, and I think if people had a better understanding of the deeper implication of this, that this might have consequences for you in 10 years, in 20 years, with regard to a lot of choices in everyday life that you cannot at all foresee right now, I think they would th think about this picture a bit differently. Yeah. One, one of the things that... Uh um, if you talk surveillance capitalism, one of the things that is uh, troublesome to, to kind of address is that uh, they are actually, uh, we are using a service that is spying on us. And yeah. it's, it's not really telling us we know something is going on and it becomes a permanent situation. What does it do to people? Well, it could be something like uh, you apply for a job in 10 years from now. Uh, you are perhaps future employee, might uh, choose you among 500 other people. And then they will ask some service, maybe called Facebook at the time, maybe something else. Can you give me some analysis of this person's uh, focusing on the amount of sick days they are very likely to have throughout one year? You know, those data are worth a lot of money. And the analysis might even be wrong, you know. <laughs> Because algorithms, and I think that's another important problem, we think it's more objective because it's an algorithm. It's not. The algorithm might be wrong, yet still that analysis means that you will never get into that job interview anyway, any case. And you cannot do anything about this because that analysis is not built on your status updates on Facebook. It's some random combination of your login history some key persons in your network or something else, you will never know, know it because it could come from any sort of platform in your, your life. You are tracked in all places right now. So you cannot personally act on this. We need regulation to deal with that problem. You were told. Uh, we, we were, uh, before we were discussing uh, Mark Zuckerberg as a uh, new kind of celebrity, and uh, I know you feel uh, the need for new kinds of celebrities. Uh, and some of, them, uh, some of the people we have been focusing on for, for a while has been the activists, uh, people like Snowden, uh, Chelsea Manning, and, uh, and people like that. Uh, where do you see these people in the, in the current picture? Well, I think uh, a very different thing uh, in, in kind of today's society where, we, like, if you look at the, the Green Movement and the activists that were part of the Green Movement, they did, if they had some celebrity status, they kind of used it to get more people into the, the scene and so on. Uh, but now most of them are trying to protect themselves. Uh, if you look at Assange, he's using more of his time to protect himself than to protect the causes. Uh, and it's, maybe it's a natural thing when you feel threatened as well. But we are, still have, like, certain celebrities, activists that, uh, that we look up to or think are going to solve situations or are going to solve the problems. So young people don't really act. And, and the, the, the activists that are like Chelsea Manning and, and Snowden and so on, you know, uh, incapacitated in, in many ways. They're not that old and still, you know, uh, people just like think that they will have the energy to, to look up to them. But it's, it's getting really lonely for, for these people. And there's not a lot of new people coming into the activist scene when it comes to info uh, activism. Uh, very few people that it are actually made a, a difference because we all have this laziness. We think these people will take care of it. And I wouldn't call him, like, Zuckerberg is not just a celebrity. He is a celebrity on the level of Kim Jong-un. Uh, he is a <laughs> dictator in the biggest state of the world. And that's <laughs> why I see him. So. <laughs> So you say, but you're saying that we, we don't have people, we are looking towards some people to, to fix things. Uh, yeah. don't, would you think, uh, did, did Snowden make a difference in your opinion? No, he didn't. I think, um, you know, he had all the right intentions. He's uh, an amazing person and he has all of the right views when it comes to this thing. But the problem is that uh, I think we as a community had the idea that when the data was out there, we would change. If things would change, things would be fixed. And if not, Snowden would make sure that would be fixed. Uh, he came out with some new software as well to try to protect people and people were in the tech community kind of upset about how bad it was and what it was actually trying to do. And then other people just like, fan people, you're gonna run with that and think you're safe. And that's also dangerous. I think it's really dangerous to have all of these um, kind of celebrities uh, that don't really do enough. Uh, and it's our fault to not try to engage more with this. Mm.
when you talked about strategies before, uh, you mentioned things like you, you need several profiles, yeah. uh, you need to uh, use uh, certain software and stuff like that, but, but that, that actually makes you act like you were a secret agent yeah. or, or something else. Uh, is that really possible for, for normal people? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think we all have secrets that we need to protect, even though they're not really always bad, but they, they can be bad in the future. That was like, if you look just a few years back, the this discussion uh, about surveillance is really different in Germany than it is in the rest of the world, because they have Stasi in their memory very close in time. Uh, and they are really much more restrictive on surveillance laws, and they understand these things on a different level, because they, as children, had you know, the mindset of people are spying on you. Uh, so definitely, we have secrets, and then you also, it's not that you are wrong, it's just that the state can change and be wrong. Mm. Um, and a few years ago, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who, her parents grew up in the 1910s, or were born in the 1910s in Germany, and they said, like, during the Nazi regime, they knew who the enemy was, whatever side you were on the conflict. Then they lived in, in uh, the Stasi regime, and they kind of knew who the enemy was. And now they're really unsafe because they don't know who the enemy is anymore. And they don't know who they can talk to and who they can't talk to, because everything is monitored by everyone. So they feel more unsafe now than knowing their place. And that is really disturbing to me to hear. We will get back to the, uh, who the enemy might be a bit yeah. later. I uh, would also like to ask Anne Mette Tohauge, as uh, you, are, you are the chairman of uh, the, the Danish Media Council for, uh, for Young and uh, for Children and the Young, how do children cope with this? They, they are uh, spend, spending a lot of time on social media. Mm. Uh, how does this debate affect them? Well, they are very pragmatic, as we all are. Uh, they learn what they have to learn to get by, and they tend to collect information about stuff they can actually do something about. Whereas stuff they cannot do anything about, they will avoid dealing with. And it's not just, you know, children and young people that do that. That's all of us who will act that way, because otherwise we would not be able to live our lives. So, uh, so in that way, when they talk about privacy, they obviously think about pr uh, privacy in relation to their parents, and in relation to their peers, and their coping strategies will be those that fit that sort of privacy, because that's really important for them right now. But they don't have a chance on earth to overview this more general, you know, surveillance, capitalism, and its implications. That's really our, our responsibility as the grown-ups. Yeah, and it's mm -hmm. our responsibility to kind of, uh, to, to try to keep Mr. Zuckerberg in place. Yeah. Yeah, but we're not doing a very good job. No, but I also think just to, uh, to add into some of the discussion about the activists, you know, activists have never changed the laws. Activists has forced the parliamentar parliamentary system to change the laws. And I think we should look at it th that way as well. So, uh, so instead of hoping that Snowden <laughs> will, uh, will make miracles, we should see his example of one we could use to hold our politicians responsible because it's still them. It's her, unfortunately. It's her who... She, she can do it, but she doesn't. I think we should move on to uh, another depressing clip. Uh, it's from uh, 1984. But he left one final warning. 1984 is, I believe, a quite terrifying masterpiece. So terrifying, in fact, I don't think I should like to read another like it. I am not absolutely dissatisfied with it. I think it is a good idea, but the execution would have been better if I had not been under the influence of TB when I wrote it. You once claimed that you have an ability to face unpleasant facts. Is that what you've demonstrated in 1984 by drawing an accurate portrait of the future? I think that allowing for the book being, after all, a parody, something like 1984 could actually happen. This is the direction the world is going in at the present time. In our world, there will be no emotions except fear, rage, triumph and self-abasement. The sex instinct will be eradicated. We shall abolish the orgasm. There will be no loyalty except loyalty to the party. But always there will be the intoxication of power. Always, at every moment, there will be the thrill of victory, the sensation 
of trampling on an enemy who is helpless. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. The moral to be drawn from this dangerous nightmare situation is a simple one. Don't let it happen. It depends on you. It's a clip you, uh, you've chosen, Peterson. Could you tell a bit about it? Well, this is, uh, it's not actually George Orwell. It's, uh, it's an actor playing George Orwell. But uh, for me, it represents that we've kind of known about the situation for quite a long while, and we've ignored it for quite a long while. And I think, unfortunately, we will keep doing that for quite a long while. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to find a way, if anyone has a good idea, of how to make people wake up from this kind of nightmare situation and realize that we're living in this. Um, if you look at what was written in 1984, most of the stuff are actually worse today. But we're in, since we're living inside of it, we don't see the situation because it's really hard to see the situation from within, just as in the Matrix. Uh, so we kind of need that pill. Uh, he was not right about everything. I always, when I, I see this clip, I think that internet has done the most for the orgasm ever, so that has not been abolished, but that's more porn hub, I guess, or <laughs> stuff like that. But otherwise, it's very accurate, I would mm. say, unfortunately. Yeah, but, but it's not the situation we are currently, we're not seeing uh, 1984 situations on the streets with, uh, with the people getting beat up or the party saying things, or, or oh. we, don't have a, we don't have a state, we have Mark Zuckerberg, or we have yeah. the guys from Google. Or well, maybe we're beating up mentally. Uh, some people are being beat up just because of what's happening on the internet as well. And I, I think we've had this idea that the internet is a separate part of society. Um, and I want people to realize uh, that the internet is an integral part of society. It's another platform for today's society. There is no difference. People that are trolls on the internet, they are people that are out on the streets as well, just as you, maybe they would be a little bit more open with what they say on the internet. Um, but uh, p things happening in society will happen on the internet and vice versa. So we need to make that, uh, to not have a distinction between those platforms. We, we don't talk about like what I said on the telephone. It's like, that's something I said to you. It's not like mm. what you wrote on Facebook. It, it is the same thing. It's communication. So is this uh, nine cities magic, which is still uh, kind of uh, gets in? It was a uh, magic thing you were connected to all over the world, and then there's, there was this feeling of uh, the magic internet, which is still kind of shining through and we are believing that it's something special, but it isn't. No, I think if you look at how regulated, let's say, uh, power grids are or roads are, those are much less important for society than the internet. And still, we have few companies that own the infrastructure, the technical, physical infrastructure of this, uh, the internet. And then you have fewer companies on top of that that are basically 95% of the traffic. Um, I don't think many people in this room could actually say how many, what, what the names are of the companies that own the fiber cables uh, and, and you know, how many fiber cables go from Denmark to the United States and how powerful Scandinavia is, for instance, when it comes to things like the internet. Uh, and that is a democratic problem. Like, uh, there is no point in having companies owning the infrastructure of the internet because it's something I need to connect to you. Why should be a company involved in this? This is just as a, a street... Uh, that should be owned by the government or in a cooperative or something. We should not have that as a commercial entity. Then you want to do commercial entities on top of that. That's a different discussion. But we need to realize that we do not own the internet. Someone else owns the internet. We are just bystanders that can utilize it as long as it's in the interest of the people that own it. We are users. We are consumers. We're not users. We're consumers. And there's a difference. There's a huge difference because users are someone who has some sort of rights. Consumers are like someone who can go somewhere else if it doesn't fit, you know. Mm. No shoes, no service, you know. I have no shoes on, I get no service. In a minute, what do you, when, when you have uh, this very uh, dark uh, clip uh, from uh, something that uh, George Orwell said for uh, an interview at the time, but what can, can we use George Orwell in 1984, uh, the mindset frame to anything today? Well, it's an excellent book, so we should read it anyway. But I think we also need other metaphors in order to understand the type of surveillance going on. So, because the metaphor going on in uh, 1984 is still the very strong state, the very, very strong state apparatus, which makes us think of the uh, former East 
uh, during the Cold War. And I think in order to understand the problems here and also understand the risks associated with it, we will have to understand that surveillance has become a lot of things. It's self-surveillance, it's intimate surveillance, it's state surveillance, it's commercial surveillance, and probably also it's different combinations of those, and it's in particular in those combinations we see some of the key problems. But people, when people say, the, the worst thing you can ever say is, oh, well, if I have nothing to hide, they can get whatever data on me. That's something people say because they still imagine this big mother state keeping an eye on you. And uh, this is not really what's going on here. This is algorithms profiling you. <laughs> it's not a person judging you morally. It's, it's a lot more complicated than that. And then it's not even the algorithm that's the problem, really. The problem is that we have so much trust in that algorithm that we let it, let it have consequences in the world that we otherwise wouldn't accept without some sort of you know, human responsibility and judgment. So, uh, so I think 1984 is a great book, and it's an important metaphor, but in order to understand the situation in day, we need metaphors for the, this you know, surveillance capitalism, that commercial surveillance, and how, how to deal with that. So I, I think actually, uh, to follow up on that, I think it's really important to realize that when you talk about self-surveillance and stuff like that, is that that very often leads to self-censorship. And I th yeah. think what people don't connect with surveillance is the censorship that comes, comes with it. Yeah. Uh, and a really interesting thing with, with 1984 was that someone put up 1984 as a, an ebook on Amazon, and yeah. they didn't have the rights to sell it, so Amazon deleted all of the books from your Kindle if you had bought it. Yeah. So all of a sudden, the book about surveillance was deleted from your, your, your own ebook uh, yeah. reader, which was just like the biggest irony of, of it all. Uh, and I, I think it's really, really dangerous when you start realizing that you are, most people are self censoring because of the surveillance. People don't put up the pictures they want to anymore mm -hmm. on social media because it could be bad for their future, uh, future businesses or whatever. They, they start doing these things. And, you have to go a little bit more offline, but that also means you become less trusting as a person. And when you start not trusting people, you become more and more like you internalize more things. And that's mm. not a good thing for your psyche in the end. Mm. Uh, and these things are something we live in today. It's not something will happen in the future. We all do this all the time. We think before we post. And, and that is uh, maybe it's a good thing as well in some cases. But uh, mm. in general, I think it's really, really dangerous. Do you even think that it's, uh, it's, after, it's no good to delete your social media accounts? No, because that's just uh, going to make you look suspicious. So uh, I, I think it doesn't really matter. I think it's more important that you stay in society because today's society is being on social media for most people. Like that's where you have your friends. And uh, like I'm not on Facebook, so I never get invited to birthday parties or stuff <laughs> like that. <laughs> And that, for me, that's great. For, for most people, it's not. I think most people want to hang out with friends. <laughs> uh, but my friends are weird enough to not be on those things. But it, it's an exception, I would say. Um, but, but you get a lonely life, and you get nothing in return. Like, society does not benefit uh, that you leave Facebook and Twitter and all, other social media. You lose. Society gains nothing. So th there's no value in that. I wouldn't say that you should leave, because you will, maybe you should alter the way you're dealing with it, yes. But if you leave, you only get loneliness. If you should go, just kind of go, just shortly go back to, to the 1984 uh, situation, then uh, I know you've got a point saying that most people don't realize that uh, if the data they put uh, out, for example, Facebook and Google and stuff like that, they also end up in state surveillance. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's um, one of the things that we talk very little is what will happen in the future with all of this. I think that's also why we're so... Uh, we, we don't really care that much about our data. A really good example in, in Sweden is that uh, in the 60s, the, the Swedish government decided to have a, a database of all newborns. So in, also from the 70s, basically everyone who's born in Sweden, they take a blood sample of the baby. And that has been used for genetic testing and uh, finding out genetic diseases. And it's been really, really important for um, finding cures for diseases and so on. In, all over the world, it's a, a really important library. Um, and then the Swedish foreign minister got killed, and they realized they had a DNA sample of the killer on her body, but they couldn't find the killer. So they realized, oh wait, we have a blood sample of all of the people born in the, since the 70s of Sweden, 
it's not allowed to be used for this, but it's an exception, exceptional case. So they went into the library and they found the DNA and they realized we have a DNA registry of all the citizens of Sweden. Um, and we never had a discussion about that because that's what's happening with data. It starts as one innocent thing and then as it progresses, it becomes bigger and that's why we talk about big data. The number and the volume makes it important and when you have collected it in a central database, you start realizing what you also could do with this. So Sweden and Norway are two really important countries in this because they never had a government uh, registry that has not changed to uh, do something else than it was supposed to do from the beginning. So it's always done something on top of that. So every time there's a registry, there will be new, uh, new things added to the usage of it. That's what you call a function creep. Yeah, and, and so, so you asked me before what I think is like uh, the, biggest, the biggest enemy, and I think for, for us it's time. I think we don't understand what will happen in the future, so we don't have a clear enemy. So I would say uh, the enemy of all of the data is time. Just take uh, another slide, which uh, should slow, show something like, let's see. Yeah, there it is, uh, which is, uh, which is a, a, a picture of a kind of activism in many ways, which might lead us somewhere. It's the Copenhagen letter. Uh, you have signed it. Uh, what was the purpose of that? So the Copenhagen was, uh, last year in Copenhagen, there was a festival, tech festival, Copenhagen Tech Festival. Uh, and it was very special because it was an open festival about technology and food and, and, and so on. And it was uh, tens of thousands of people there. And uh, one thing that happened was that uh, this letter was written about uh, ethics in, uh, in technology, because that's one of the things that we've been lacking, is like most, uh, most organizations, most movements have some sort of manifesto or like ethical uh, guidelines that they follow, but technology doesn't really have that. We well, have Google used to have one. Uh, Google called. used to be don't be evil, and yeah. they actually removed that two weeks ago, so yes. that's not part of them anymore. <laughs> um, so for me that means be evil, but Okay, we have different views. Uh, but the, the letter here is like, uh, lots of people that are really important in the tech community signed this, co-wrote this letter, uh, realizing, like uh, the discussion was really interesting because you were sitting there with really powerful, influencing people in technology in the industry, saying that we have too much power, people don't know how much power we have, we don't want this power, we, want, we need it to be regulated by society. It's not fair to society that we have this much power. You wouldn't really see that in most industries, that people mm -hmm. realize that I'm the problem. So I, I think that's why the, the letter was really important to me, that it was written and signed by these people. And it made it do the thing we can have yeah. this again, uh, inside technology. Yeah, well, uh, I think we were both there when the, this Copenhagen letter was made, and I think one of... Well, one of my key points that unfortunately no, did not get into the letter was the whole ownership issue that you were talking about before. Yeah. And I think it does, you know, signal some of the problems about this way of going about a lot of really, really nice and kind people uh, going together to do good stuff. But, you know, Facebook is not there, Google is not there, Amazon is not there, and also there is not this will to actually accept that this is a matter of politics, good old politics, such as going back to who owns the infrastructure. So in that way, even though I really like the letters of the, you know, the words of the letter, and I did sign it, uh, sign it as well, I still think that it's, um, uh, yeah, I, uh, it's not even activism. <laughs> it's a sub-activism at some level, and. Uh, I wouldn't expect small tech developers to be those who change the, uh, the world in that manner. No, I think the, the thing that could come out of this, hopefully, is that people yeah. working for Facebook or Google would read this and realize I'm part of the problem, maybe leak some yeah. other information that it could actually change something. We actually That's yeah. my biggest goal. There actually was a bit of a, a problem at, at Google where a lot of their employees uh, made, it, uh, they made a public letter to, uh, to their bosses saying that we don't want uh, Google's AI to be used in weapons. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And we think that's the wrong way to go. But anyway, they continued doing that. They're yeah. still, still using Google AI and weapons, and they don't seem to, uh, to want to change that. We're kind of running out of time, but I need to, to, we need to end on a, a light note, <laughs> in my opinion. This is a very nice gift. I like it. It's called, uh, it's called Luke Seagull. Uh, take this very expensive donuts. Uh, one last, the last question here is that we, we've been, 
in my opinion, rather pessimistic, uh, at least uh, uh, at least me and you, and maybe you too. But uh, what should what can we do in the future? Should it be uh, like this? Could we accidentally throw our phones in the water or something like that? What's happening? No, I, I, uh, I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist, as everyone says. But uh, I think that we can't really do anything. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, we can't really do anything. Uh, let someone else, the younger generation, fix this because we screwed up and we're not going to be able to fix it. We're not really fixing climate change either. You know, uh, I, I think you know, we, we can hope, but yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, obviously, I have to disagree on that. You know, uh, Facebook has a very clear interest in us taking that position. We will have to con continue fighting as we always have because this is an endless fight, but we have to fight it. And uh, on top of that, I would say we will have to recognize agency in many contexts. We can do some, not all, but we can do some as individuals. Other stuff will have to be done at a national level, and a lot of stuff will have to be done at an international level, and we have a great job holding our politicians responsible, but we have to do it. We cannot give up. It's not an option. So, we have the, that will be the last words of uh, today's session. <laughs>